Are we maybe one Supreme Court decision away from the ATF being able to classify virtually all semi-automatic firearms? We're talking handguns, rifles, shotguns, AR-15s, Glocks, AKs, you name it, as potentially being machine guns under many, if not most circumstances? Maybe. I'm going to make the case for what I'm thinking, and I'll explain it in this video. But first, let me lead with a couple quotes about the bump stock case presently being argued in the Supreme Court. Quote, here's the bottom line. The ATF lacks authority under the law to ban bump stocks, period. The agency made this crystal clear in 2010 and again in 2013 letter to Congress, writing that stocks of this type are not subject to the provisions of the federal firearms statutes in relation to machine guns. The ATF Association, which represents the Bureau's rank and file, reiterated that, quote, the law is very clear and it does not currently allow the ATF to regulate such accessories, end quote, speaking of bump stocks. Those are not my words. Those are not Tom Greaves' words. Those are the words of the late U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, noted civilian disarmament enthusiast, when she spoke up against the ATF attempting to modify their administrative code. That's the code that explains how they are allowed to interpret laws and, of course, enforce them to illegally change the definition of what is a machine gun. The ATF decided to ultimately disregard her advice and plowed ahead, creating the very issue that's now being argued in the U.S. Supreme Court case of Garland versus Cargill. What are the legal and logical sleight of hands that are being played out in the U.S. Supreme Court? Let's get into it. Listen up. I'm going to make this really simple so even folks at the DOJ and the ATF can understand. Here's what is going on. 26 U.S.C. Section 5845. That's the law passed by Congress, defines a machine gun in part as basically a firearm that fires more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. This was the law for decades. And then in 2018, the ATF introduced their own administrative code changes. You can also find that in the description box below that effectively move the goalposts on what is a machine gun. The goalposts are what Congress said they are, which is more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. What the ATF is doing is basically looking at what devices accelerate the functions of the trigger. That's it. That's it. Congress said if it fires more than one shot per function of the trigger, it's a machine gun. ATF backed this up and said this in 2010 as well as in 2013. Now they're saying, well, if a device accelerates the functions of the trigger, suddenly it's a whole new world. It's a brave new world, some might say. Why does this matter? We're going to be getting into that in the analysis later on. But suffice to say, there are profound effects and consequences about this. And a lot of folks, both on right, left, pro-gun, anti-gun, like U.S. Senator Feinstein, have argued the ATF lacks this power to make this massive, massive change. So I was driving into my office today and I was not planning on making a video. I had other things I was going to be doing, but I was listening to the oral arguments in Garland versus Cargill that was playing out on Wednesday, February 8th, 2024. And it got to a part where there was an exchange between U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who was first listening to the logic and arguments by U.S. Principal Deputy Solicitor General Brian Fletcher, and then posed questions to him about machine guns, bump stocks. And I thought it was pretty interesting. And for starters, for those of you who don't know and you're not so U.S. Supreme Court nerds, first off, congratulations on having hobbies and a life. Uh, but for those of us who do follow some of these things, let me clue you in on something. Justice Thomas went, I think it was about 10 years, between 2006 and 2016, where he asked, I'm not sure he asked a single question during oral arguments. He's generally not known as the chatty Cathy of U.S. Supreme Court justices. So when he leaps into the questions, let alone when he leads them, you know something interesting might be coming. I'm going to play this. It's going to be a couple minutes long. It's going to be interesting, and then we're going to build on it. Uh, Mr. Fletcher, um, how does a machine gun, what would I have to do to fire a machine gun? 
It depends on the machine gun. Uh, some, it's a push, of a, tr a push of a button. Some, it's a pull of a trigger. The statutory definition is, does it shoot more than one shot automatically by a single function of the trigger? But I don't have to uh, in do anything else. I don't have to put pressure on it or anything else. It depends on the gun, again. So if you imagine, I think what your question is getting at is, if you take a traditional M16 rifle, yeah. what we often think of when we think of a machine gun, you're right. To fire more than one shot, you pull the trigger and you have to hold it back, and as long as you maintain that backward pressure on the trigger, it keeps shooting. With the bump stock, what would I do different? Okay, so you're hearing the argument about basically, and the sleight of hands about how, well, look, you know, machine guns... Machine guns, basically, it doesn't matter if you pull the trigger towards you or if you push your shoulder into it to actuate a device like a bump stock. Really, we're just looking at the pull or the push, and it's all the same. That's really what's going on here. And, of course, the sleight of hand is he's trying to ignore the statute because we're dealing with, one, a real machine gun, as I already mentioned, fires more than one shot per function of the trigger, and, two, a non-machine gun, like a slide fire bump stock device, all that's doing is accelerating the functions of the trigger. That's the government's sleight of hand here. But then Justice Thomas got into something interesting. Here's the follow-up line of questions. You would do different, the, the, both the initial motion and the motion that continues. It's the same thing in the sense that one motion automates back and forth movement and results in multiple shots. So what, what is motion. happening with the a trigger initiated firing of a machine gun? What do I have to do other than depress the trigger? With a traditional machine gun, again, take an M16, and again, we think they're all machine guns, yeah. but I understand the question to be, take an M16, you pull the trigger back and you hold it and it keeps shooting. Okay. With, with a bump stock, you push forward and that both initiates and continues the firing. And what is happening with the trigger when you have the recoil? That's exactly right. So I think this gets to respondents' primary argument on function of a trigger, which is that the difference with a bump stock is that it fires multiple shots automatically by automating the movement of the trigger. So my friend says the trigger moves back and forth every time a shot is fired. Our view is that those subsequent movements of the trigger aren't functions of the trigger because they're not responding to separate acts, separate pulls, or anything else by the shooter. They're just the result of so the So what is happening with the trigger when someone doesn't need a bump stock to bump fire a, a weapon. So this is the, man, the unassisted manual bump yeah. firing that's described, where an expert can take a regular semi-automatic rifle and hold it loosely enough that they can do something like bump firing. And I think in our view there, too, there's just one function of the trigger because the first push starts the sequence and then the sequence continues. The ATF explained, and we agree, that that's not automatic because there's no self-regulating mechanism. The user has to So what's the, the difference? Uh, the same thing is happening with the trigger. The same thing is happening with the trigger, and I think that's why we would say with manual bump firing, there is just a single function of the trigger. There's one action that initiates the firing sequence. We think it's not automatic because there's no self-regulating mechanism. The user is having to do all of the work that the bump stock automates for you on a rifle fitted with a bump. Okay, so the DOJ attorney, Mr. Fletcher, is saying that, look, neither the Department of Justice or the ATF are concerned about individuals who are just bump firing using a belt loop or maybe just their own fingers. And for those of you who do not know what bump firing is, I'll put a link to a video in the description box below. You can also just search up how do I bump fire an AR-15 or something like that. When he classifies this as something that seemingly only experts can initiate, pff, you be the judge on that, okay? Guys, really quickly, if you can help us out, hit that like button if you've not already done so. It does fantastic things like showing your support for the Second Amendment, trying to push back on ATF overreach, send that message, hit the like button. Also, don't forget to, of course, join the discussion in the comment field below. I look forward, as frankly I always do, but I look forward to checking them out here. Now back to the video. The point is this, where they are now redrawing the line is it has to be a device that automates the functions of the trigger, okay? Not the function of the trigger, that is the trigger, but we're talking about the functions of the trigger. So that's how they're going from what the law is to what they're trying to get it re effectively reinterpreted into, but now they're drawing this new boundary of, look, people who just go ahead and use a belt loop or them themselves to bump fire uh, a semi-automatic rifle that's okay because effectively the individuals are doing it themselves and they don't view that as being a machine gun because the machine gun statute says that it must be a device that regulates the automatic fire. That's the English version of what just happened. Bump fire, not a device. Slide fire, that's the device. That's the distinguishing factor. All right, stay with me. 
I've got two more pieces to add to the chessboard. And then we're gonna move them around and you're gonna see what I'm going for. Remember in 2004, when someone sent a, I think it may have been a Mini 14, I don't remember, but someone sent to the ATF a semi-automatic rifle with a 14 inch shoestring with two loops rigged up to it. And effectively, if you pulled one of the loops, it made the firearm fire more than one shot per trigger pull, one shot per function of the trigger in essence. The ATF wrote a letter back basically saying, look, this shoestring is now a machine gun. Then, they, of course, they kind of backed that off subsequent to that back in 2007. But more on that story if you want in the description box. Bottom line, okay, they said that that is now a machine gun. The shoestring is now a machine gun. Here's the last piece. It deals with the last phrase of the machine gun statute, which again is in the description box below. It reads in part, quote, any combination of parts from which a machine gun can be assembled if such parts are in the possession or under the control of, of a person, end quote, then you have a machine gun. So if you've got all the parts needed to make a machine gun, it's a machine gun. You've got all the pieces now. We're going to touch on constructive possession in a moment, but let's start playing chess. Let's start moving them. All right, we've covered many times what is at stake in the Cargill case. I'm not going to redo all of that here. I want to focus you in on this one particular issue. If the U.S. Supreme Court allows the ATF to move the goalposts from a machine gun was and is more than one shot per function of the trigger into and becoming, we look at how fast you can function the trigger using some sort of device, that opens up a world of regulation. Because realistically, once we start talking about constructive possession laws, almost all semi-automatic firearms can be converted or readily converted or assembled into a machine gun at that point. In 2004, of course, the ATF decided that a shoestring with a few loops that you could go buy down at probably Walmart, that is a machine gun. What isn't a machine gun? Are we all going to be forced to wear Velcro shoes, for instance? Because the constructive possession laws, which I've got a whole video on that linked in the description box below, but the very short version is that if you have all the parts needed to assemble something that's illegal and they're all alone such that you can assemble it only into that one device, it's as if legally you have made that constructive possession. You've made that constructive intent, as some people call it, that you wish to assemble that device, i.e. pile of parts that can be assembled only into a short barrel rifle is legally a short barrel rifle, all right? Super short version. If suddenly we are now looking at extending this analysis to what are all the parts that can be assembled into a machine gun by looking at how quickly we can accelerate the function of the trigger, is this effectively going to end up someday, not right away, but someday down the line, banning semi-automatic firearms that can very easily be manipulated by using, you know, those rare things like assault shoelaces into being machine guns. Is this a backdoor attack? Let me be clear, when I was driving to the office this morning and I was, I was listening to the oral arguments from this case and it got to this point, my initial reaction for those of you who know me is I'm not somebody who's out there fear mongering, I'm not someone who's out there pushing what I view as conspiracy theories or something like that. But you've got to admit, we are in a strange timeline. If we're at this point, and I just had to articulate the difference between one function of the trigger equals one shot or more than one shot versus devices that function the trigger. And the United States government, including the Department of Justice and ATF, doesn't understand that distinction. If we are at there, What's really going to be beyond the pale for an aggressive political anti-gun prosecutor? The simple answer is I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. As always, you be the judge. If you've stuck around this long, I appreciate that. Helps us out. Be sure to, of course, leave your comment down below. Don't forget that like button if you've not already done so. If you just caught us while browsing through the YouTubes, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you want to check out any of our future content. Now to our ever popular quote of the day. This one comes from the Greek philosopher Plato. Quote, the measure of a man is what he does with power, end quote. Maybe fitting. 
Again, we appreciate you sticking around. I'll see you in the discussion section and in the next video. Take care. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.